Marianne Van Hoof. As a youth, Marianne suffered from epileptic seizures. Marianne was baptized Catholic but was not raised in the church. Her childhood was an unhappy one and she was repeatedly beaten by her father. Marianne Van Hoof started her career in spiritualism as a medium with Hungarian gypsies. She came to America with her mother Elizabeth Bieber, who also practiced witchcraft with gypsies. Those who knew Marianne at the time claimed she had a child out of wedlock, married a divorced man, divorced him, and did not go to church for 20 years. She married again in 1934 to Fred Van Hoof. She did not begin attending Mass regularly until 1949. Marianne and her husband went to Texas to get away from her damned Catholic relatives, her words. They then fled to Missouri to get away from Texas's creditors. Later in Nesita, they lived so poorly that they had no running water. Mary Ann's house was always filthy, and the children were seldom bathed. I was calling the family to dinner, and as I stooped over to brush a mosquito off my leg, I noticed a flash of light. I looked up, and out through the screen door I saw a blue mist behind the ash trees. Then out of the mist I visioned the figure of our Holy Mother. Oh, she was so radiant and beautiful. An artist could not paint her to do her justice. During that visitation, the Blessed Virgin gave Van Hoof a list of dates on which she would return. Van Hoof's followers soon began buying up the land and building homes around her farm, which was two miles outside of Nesida. The Virgin Mary was said to have promised that anyone living within five miles of the Van Hoofs would be spared on the day of chastisement. Followers also bought a print shop to publish and distribute their literature, as well as solicit donations worldwide. They then formed a tax-exempt corporation, For My God and My Country, Inc. Van Hoof's farm was turned into an information center and an outdoor shrine with life-size glass-encased statues of religious figures. Several of the nation's most prominent newspapers and magazines, including Life, featured stories about her. The hype surrounding a promise that the Virgin Mary would appear August 15, 1950, brought an estimated 100,000 people to Nesita by chartered buses, trains, and cars. Van Hoof blessed the assembly with the crucifix that had glowed in her bedroom and repeated the Virgin's new message into a microphone for all to hear. 30,000 priests in the United States were planted communist spies, and that the U.S. government had been infiltrated by a cunning plot to corrupt the true way, and that Vatican II was false and should not be obeyed. The Virgin insisted that one's religion was of little importance. Vatican II was said to be a false council and the new mass was likewise condemned. It was said that all schools, churches, and governments had been infiltrated and that even food was being used as a form of mind control. Marianne also claimed to see the Blessed Trinity and the angels and saints, all as six-inch figures that would appear on trees, fences, furniture, and every other conceivable place. She pointed to them in trees, on fences, on her furniture, everywhere. Then she carried on a one-way conversation with them and reported to the people what was said after she had finished. Some pilgrims claimed to see the sun spin or change colors, while others saw a cross on it. Rosaries changed to a gold color. Countless cures of body and soul were reported. In 1950 and 1951, her followers say, Van Hoof suffered the stigmata, the crucifixion wounds of Jesus, as her arms stretched so securely to an invisible cross that five men could not budge them. Friends reported seeing her convulse and then collapse to the floor in a cruciform pose. Van Hoof had always been sickly and Mary explained that she was a victim soul. During Advent, she claimed to have acquired the saintly phenomenon of anedia in which she could survive without food. All solid food reportedly made her vomit and she subsisted entirely on liquids. In May 1951, Bishop Treacy sent Van Hoof a letter ordering her to take down the statues affiliated with her shrine and to cease disseminating literature about her visions. According to Fidelity magazine, Van Hoof replied to this order, I am a free American citizen, this is my own property, and I'll do as I wish. A panel of three psychiatrists concluded that she suffered from hysteria and repressed sexual anxiety. Adding insult to injury, Father Claude H. Heithhouse, a member of the bishop's investigating committee, discussed the results of the study with the press and described the convulsions associated with Van Hoof's stigmata as a disgusting performance. On June 17, 1955, John Treacy, the Bishop of La Crosse, declared that all claims regarding supernatural revelations and visions made by the aforementioned Mrs. Van Hoof are false. Furthermore, all public and private religious worship connected with these false claims is prohibited at Nacida, Wisconsin. On December 5, 1958, 
A request was made from the Celestials in Heaven to obtain a four-foot white corpus of our Lord and have it ready for the December 12, 1958 suffering. At this time, instructions were given for Marianne to mark the corpus with red and purple crayons as she viewed the scourging of our Lord. Marianne marked the bruises, lacerations, and blood where they had appeared on our Lord's body. This was to serve as a model for the sculptors and the artists to follow when making the life-size corpus, which, as requested, is now on the grounds in the crucifixion shrine. Over the next 26 years, until her death in 1984, Van Hoof would relate a constant stream of messages from the Virgin Mary, in which Jesus' mother used surprisingly colloquial turns of phrase and appeared particularly interested in everything from the threat of world communism to nuclear submarines to integrated schools. Over time, the purported messages from heaven got stranger and more elaborate, unspooling Baroque conspiracy theories. In one message, Van Hoof reported that baby subs were sailing up the St. Lawrence Seaway. Shrine associates claimed that a spaceship would transport the faithful to an underground civilization, Middle Earth at the end of the world. She kept tight control over everyone by claiming that she could bi-locate and saw people engaging in sins, and she was unnaturally strong. She was known to throw adults across the room when angry. She sold magic boxes and magic pillows that she claimed could do almost anything. In 1975, Bishop Freaking excommunicated and refused sacraments to anyone who attended, participated, approved, associated with, contributed to, anything whatsoever associated with the shrine at Nesida, whether pageants, prayer meetings, devotions, venerations, visits, meetings, classes, secret meetings, strategy meetings, seances, movies, books, or anything else, whether at the shrine or away from it. Marianne's response to this was to bring in an already excommunicated old Roman Catholic bishop, Edward Stalick. In the early 1980s, three men consecrated as bishops by the Spanish antipope Paul VI and a British seeress dwarf named Patricia McElliott regularly traveled to Nasida and illicitly consecrated a priest there. Several of these priests were later exposed as frauds. Some had lied about their training, their status, or in some cases that they were priests at all. Brother Glenn Gergen ran a radio program on the Shrine property. He had a police record of fraud, disorderly conduct, and statutory rape. He tapped the old Roman Catholic bishop's phone and attempted to blackmail him. David Schott, a Shrine Auxiliary Bishop, was convicted of sexually molesting an 11-year-old boy. He continued to keep a 10-year-old boy with him. He was arrested again. Assisted by Shrine members, he escaped. Bishop Stalick left the Shrine, and it was later learned that he was gay. Stalick denounced the Nisida apparition as a hoax. A second such bishop, Frank de Benedetto, replaced him until May 1983. He too left the group and denounced Marianne as a fraud. Van Hoof said she continued to receive private revelations from the Virgin Mary until her death. In her later life, she also claimed visions of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Joan of Arc, and others. Van Hoof died in 1984, but several hundred followers remained in Nisida and continued to promote the shrine. In 1987, Gary McLaughlin, another shrine priest, was convicted of mail fraud and impersonating a priest. The sleepy town of Nasida saw many strange figures arrive in ensuing years such as self-styled Pope Clemens XIII, head of the Order of St. Michel, and the founder of the New Church. This sect believed in the salvation of mankind with the help of extraterrestrials. Henry Binkowski, a World War II vet, stocked his shrine house with an arsenal of weapons and over 100 rounds of ammunition. He made a maze of concrete walls, foxholes, and peepholes inside his house and stocked it with canned goods. One day he went crazy and shot his friend Tommy Huber. The police came, and in a gun battle with Binkowski, he was shot dead. At least 40 families continue their affiliation with the shrine, convinced that they represent the true Catholic Church. They operate a private school on the shrine grounds that attracts about 125 children. Currently, the shrine is officially known as Queen of the Holy Rosary Mediatrix between God and Man and is aligned with the North American Old Catholic Church, Ultrajectine tradition. People poo-poo apparition sites and the bishops and priests tell their people not to come, that it's a hoax, said Bordak, a nun who first visited the shrine in 1972. They ought not tell their people that. This is an actual apparition site. It's genuine. Behind the sacred spot is a half-built circle of concrete bricks with rusting rebar poking out, part of what was supposed to be a large house of prayer.